Lauren, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Wow. I I really love your energy and uh, the space that you hold, especially for your guests before we start recording. So I feel like we're going to be able to add a lot of value to the audience today. And this is going to be a great conversation. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So uh, we've been connected on social for a minute. We're finally making, apparently we've been running in similar circles and like missing masterminds and who knows, but looking forward to, to chopping it up today. For people that don't know you and your story, give us the spark notes, you know, who you are, where are you coming from and what are you doing now? Yeah. So one of the most like gossip thing, like reactions that, you know, when, when you tell someone something and they're like, oh, and they gasp, you know, whenever I tell people my business has made below hundred K profit per month in the last three years, like that's the reaction I always get. And the reason I share that is, is not, you know, it, it's, it's because I honestly kept things really, really simple. Like I've always had a very, very simple, boring kind of online business. And I found out about the power of leveraging social media at a very young age. So I pretty much started on Instagram with zero intention to ever make money. Mm -hmm. I think it was more exciting to generate my first 300 pounds, which back then was like $400 than ever seeing like 100K in your bank account or like a million in your bank account. You know what I mean? And so... What's really interesting is, and the reason I say about the money stuff is because I think so many people are so obsessed with making so much money when really I've learned over the years that for me, peace of mind is literally the most priceless thing in the world. Yeah. And so if you're doing something just to earn some cash, but you don't feel fulfilled while you're doing it, or you're doing something with a business partner who you literally hate, who's a total narcissist, and they're destroying your energy and your entire self-worth every day. It is totally not worth it. And so I've had all these things throughout my journey, but started out in fitness. And interestingly enough, I, I guess from what you just told me before we recorded, like that's how we connected. And um, I then from there, pretty much started seeing, well, a lot of people that are following me are other fitness people. So I'm really good at social media. They're always asking me for tips because I used to do this daily thing, Tickner's tips on my stories mm -hmm. and um, answering questions. And I would always get questions from fitness coaches. Like, how do you build your business? Like, how did you become such a successful personal trainer? I was like, dude, I was never a personal trainer. I was always doing stuff online because I'm lazy and I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. <laughs> so, yeah. so I would kind of tell them that and they were so confused. And I was pretty much just facing something that I enjoyed, right? So started selling personal branding courses, again, using social media, had a lead generation agency, again, got my clients all from social media, wasn't running ads, but the common thread was that I was always just chasing the thing at the time that I was really, really interested in. And when I was working in corporate, which was a very short stint for me, this woman, and this was before all of this, she said to me, Lauren, never mix your passion and your career because you'll begin to resent your career. And I believed her for such a long period of time. So I was always questioning everything I was doing on social. But now I realized that was like the worst advice ever because she was the one who was miserable in her job. And then I was thankfully able to go out there and make the dream business for myself. And of course there have been things along the way that have been total hell because that's just the fact yeah. of owning a business that I think, you know, sometimes we see all these people on social media and we think everything is sunshine and rainbows. But actually, even those really hard times are so much easier when what you're doing is actually important to you. And so for me, what I've learned is that helping people genuinely love their business, like that's what lights me up because I know how hard it is sometimes as a business owner to be driven by the wrong things or to allow situations to lead us down the wrong path. And it doesn't have to be as difficult as it needs to be. So that's like the brief summary of myself. And my, I really, I just really love social media, honestly, because it created so much freedom and fulfillment for me in my life. And now I love helping other people do the same thing. Yeah. Social media is such a powerful tool. I remember like, I remember when I first downloaded Instagram, it was during my first software engineering job. I was in like a training down on wall street right after college. And I like, I look back cause I still, I stumbled upon screenshots the other day from it and you see how shitty the UI was back then. And it's yeah, just yeah. so funny, 
fast forward, every single one of our leads comes from Instagram. Uh, 95% of it organic. And it's just crazy to think about um, the paradigm around it, right? And all the different worlds within it, which I'm sure we'll dive into. Talk to me about when you were in corporate, what were you doing? Asset management. So I was basically operating between the fund managers, the, the head of strategy, and then also the operations. So I was in between all, all of those. It was kind of interesting, but they just didn't give me anything really to do except check Bloomberg all the time. Sounds fun. Um, I don't blame you for leaving. Uh, so from there, did you go directly into fitness? So I started my Instagram fitness account two years before that because okay. I was on a fitness journey. And all I wanted in the beginning was to connect with like-minded girls who were also trying to be healthy because there was this whole culture. And I guess it still probably exists. I just haven't seen it myself, but this whole culture of like, th like thin inspiration becomes skinny. And it was really, really dark, honestly. And I got really, really shredded. Like I was not muscly, but I looked muscly because I was so lean, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I was having panic attacks every single day because I was eating legitimately nothing. The cortisol my blood test was like through the roof. Yeah. And because I was like 16 at the time, my mom had to come and pick me up from school pretty much every day early because my panic attacks were so bad. And so then while I was in the corporate world, I was really strong. I was really healthy. I was really happy in my fitness life. But then the corporate job just felt like it's derailing me from what I want to be doing all the time. So I kind of had the Instagram fitness account at the same time. I had like 20,000 followers. But back then, 20,000 followers is like the equivalent of. Yeah, a lot. Like, like, like 500,000 now. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was Instagram, not not like TikTok, like proper, like engaged community. And so people were always asking me for, you know, will you do training for me, et cetera. And I was like, no, because no, in fitness, you don't make any money. And I was so driven to make so much money. Because I thought to make the money, you have to be with the money. And so that's why I was trying to work in finance, mm -hmm. which is totally not true. Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's kind of how it all began. But it wasn't very intentional in the beginning. Yeah. I love how that, that always tends to be how it works, right? Mm. It's like the dots, what's that Steve Jobs quote? The dots never connect moving forward. You can only connect them moving backwards, or I know the one you mean. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know what word for what, but that. yeah. Um. Okay. So you start to build this this social media. You you were not intending to like market yourself. You were just trying to connect and just share your journey, essentially. Yeah. Like the first time I realized you could make money on social media was when a company sent me a box of protein bars, and they said we'll pay you three hundred pounds to post this on your Instagram. And I was like, three hundred pounds to make a post on Instagram. And I remember my dad turning to me and he says, Lauren, is this actually legal? And he kept making this banter like, are you sure these bars are not poisoned? Yeah. Because back then, again, no one was doing influencer marketing. It's a normal thing to do now. But yeah. back then, that's not even a concept. Mm -hmm. So I, <laughs> in the beginning, I thought, well, oh my gosh, I should just be an influencer. They yeah. were calling it like a micro influencer back then. And then interestingly enough, I went to university after that. And my first job, well, no, sorry. In my university, you had to do like one placement. Well, two placements. But my first placement, like a, 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 how do you call it in America? Like a, a internship. Mm -hmm. Internship. Yeah. So <laughs> my company was an influencer marketing agency. My friend owned it. So I went and basically worked there. And so I was getting paid like 1,000 pounds a month from this, nothing. And um, it's crazy, <laughs> so mad. And, um, but the great thing is I was the one controlling all of the influencer campaigns. So I just gave myself all the brand deals. <laughs> That's so fun. So, yeah, so I like ended up making a ton of money. And then obviously, yeah, from there, basically I was I was already running a fitness business, but yeah, doing online coaching and then also selling eBooks. I sold like 7,000 of these eBooks 
selling for like 45 or to like $65 per thing. So that all happened over a, a couple of years. And then I realized that I hated selling the low ticket stuff personally, because yes, I was making a ton of cash, but I wasn't fulfilled. Mm-hmm. It was honestly like I was selling the stuff, but I didn't feel anything. And then yeah. I just thought, well, what's the point of all of this? Because I genuinely prefer when I was doing a free challenge because the community was engaging back with me. I, yeah. I honestly enjoyed that way more than trying like to sell all this low ticket stuff all, all the time. It just became, it became really testing for me because I was just confused. Like this whole life up until now from going to private school in the UK near London, probably like you, where you're just outside of, you were outside of New York. I was outside of London. It's like the dream for everybody is to go and work in the stock market. Right. And I had that dream and I was not making much money from doing that, but I could have been on a track to like a six figure salary by the age of my early twenties. And then when I finally actually started to make a lot of money, I was feeling so numb because I didn't feel any impact, even though this was something that I had created. And I became really confused. And so then I went back to selling more premium price packages on social media for fitness. And I enjoyed it way more, even though it was harder to actually sell that for me back then, because I was so young. It, I didn't have so much credibility in the eyes of the parents that I had to sell to. I, when I could sell directly to the girls, I could easily sell something for like $40, you know? So it was an interesting realization for me because I just thought, well, I always thought that money was the thing that was driving me. But actually, it wasn't at all. It was the freedom. And it wasn't just the freedom. It was the freedom plus the fulfillment together. That was the most important things for me. That's such an interesting lesson because it's one of those that you can't like, it's so hard to learn by listening to someone else, right? Like the, it's not all about money. Then your default response if we're operating out of scarcity is, well, that's easy to say when you have money, but then it, until you start to generate the money, you can't learn the lesson that it's not all about that for you. Um, Mm -hmm. As you started to generate more more cash flow and and the business started to grow, like was that the moment where it started to really really take off? Because obviously there's a, a pretty decent gap from that part in the journey to not having been less than 100k a month in net profit for three years straight. Like what what was the pivotal point? The pivotal point was when I actually realized this is a business. Mm, tell me more. So the whole time in fitness and when I was selling personal branding courses, I just thought this is my income. I didn't see it as a business. Literally. Sorry. (laughs) I think it was, I honestly think when I finally had that realization was during the lockdowns. Mm. Embarrassingly enough, I didn't even realize that it was like a legit business. I thought the whole time that this is just my income and I didn't separate anything. I didn't separate my personal income from my business. So what my company was making, I thought, oh, this is my money. Like, and it was, to be honest, it was. Yeah. There was really like not many team members or if they were, they were kind of, there was no structure. There were no systems other than systems to generate leads, sell stuff and and deliver it to the client. There was no like operational structure or anything really. So to be honest, I can't tell you when this happened. It wasn't like one day I just suddenly woke up and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about this all wrong. It happened. It happened over quite a period of time. Because even for example, when I did this road trip with this girl that was working for me, she was a closer in the beginning of 2020 actually and she would be sat next to me in the car like listening to me close sales and then she would then close the sale and I would listen to her and we would go back and forth like that but it was like my direct involvement was the direct output of the business Mm -hmm. and I just never saw it like well I never actually saw it as a business I saw it this is my personal income and so I treated it like 
this is just me because that's how it began. It all happened organically. There was no strategy behind, I'm going to build this really successful online coaching empire and I'm going to reverse engineer it so that I hire all the right people and do all the right strategies and campaigns. And da, da, da. There was none of that. And so that's kind of, yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I don't, it's really interesting reflecting back on it because I hadn't thought about this for a while, but I see this a lot, honestly, even simple things like, okay, I had a company actual structure. Like I did have a, like a legal entity of a business, but yeah. despite having that, I didn't, I didn't treat it that way. And I see a lot of people who don't even have like an LLC or a limited company. And then they end up getting a tax bill for huge amounts because it's all personal income tax. Mm -hmm. so. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's like, it's such a subtle shift. But like the, the way that I've always explained it is like, we'll talk about money in, in this sense. It's the business's money. It's not my money. This is how I always think about it. Like the money belongs to the business. I own the business, but it's not my money. Mm -hmm. Right. And like a little subtle shift like that is, is so it's completely different. Like my money is the salary and the commissions that I take. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe like owners, like profit distributions or whatever, if you run a profit first model, but like, that's really it. Other than yeah. that, it's everything belongs to the entity and it stays in the entity. I used to feel really guilty as well for not paying my team huge amounts of money. So I, I way overpaid, way overpaid everyone because they would see how much the business was making. And because I believe so deeply, this is just an extension of me. In my head, I had this massive guilt for not paying huge amounts of that out to them, like way above market rate, way above even what would be like a normal above market rate, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, it was, it was challenging and it, it, it led to, it just led to a lot of confusion for me. But again, I had no idea what I was doing because when you first start a business, if you don't get the right help, then you have no idea what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm so curious about this part of the journey because obviously what you what you've built with your company with Impact School is very impressive and like I our company has grown really well and I'm really grateful for it and I've gotten a taste of like the lessons that would be required to get to even like many levels below where you guys are and I look at that I'm like those are just like I'll explain this later on, but like, those are lessons that I'm just, it's not worth it to me. Like, I don't want to do that. And I'm having those realizations. So I have so much respect for people that endured through that and really have gotten to those levels. As you were embracing this shift, like, I guess at what point did you realize like, wow, I'm, I'm not treating this like a business and like, it's time to kind of spin the wheels a little bit differently. When I finally found a good operator who could actually run the day-to-day -day and then plug her into like a proper structure. Because until then, I was like the visionary business owner person, content creator. Like I can build, like I can attract attention and get visibility really easily. Like I'm very good at that. But the operations is like hell to me. And so when I found a good operator I could actually trust, then I thought, oh, like this isn't, just about me calling all the shots all the time. And I was never one of those people to like, say, you're going to do this and we must do that. Honestly, I was way too soft on people. That was part of the problem was yeah, that I was just like, relate. oh yeah, like work whenever you want. Like we don't need to have team meetings, none of this. When I finally found someone who she was so passionate about the vision, really, really believed in the mission so strongly because she had actually been a client of mine and when she came in and she could actually organize things, I was like, whoa, this is actually like a legit business now. Like I see this differently. And so I began then actually taking it seriously to just operationalize things. And I was very resistant to operationalizing things for the longest time because for a lot of business owners, operation sounds like hell because it's like, oh, all this structure, like you're gonna make me take a call every single day. I have to show up at the same time every day. You know, it just sounds like in the beginning, I, I was so resistant to that. So I would always, it, we'd have a meeting on the calendar for a certain time. And then I'd be like, okay, let's take the call at this time instead. 
And I would do this constantly. I would always just change things around all over the place. People would come onto the team. They would leave. It was so chaotic. And when I realized, oh my God, I can't keep doing this. It's not all about me. It's about the mission of the company. It's about actually serving the clients. It's not just me, 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 me. I'm not the one that calls all the shots here. Like we have to lead by the outcome that we're taking our clients to. So that was a very profound realization to me, which I don't know why I didn't get it sooner because I thought, I think, I think this is why. I think I thought that my direct input will, would be what led to the, the result for the client. And so I thought if I do more on my terms, when I want to do it, we are actually going to achieve the thing that we want to achieve in business. Um, when that was absolutely not the case. <laughs> yeah. Anymore. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's, it, it's common for people to think that way, right? Like if you're the face of the company, you built the company, you built the programs, you're generating the early results that led to the massive growth. It, it's, I feel like that's a common thought pa pattern. Um, as you were growing into the leader who was building this and you were, I don't want to say swallowing your pride. That's not really the word, but like learning the operations, right. And like accepting that this is okay. Maybe we should probably operate this way and relinquishing control. You mentioned that you were really soft on people, um, maybe to a yeah. fault. And I can absolutely relate to that. The, the whole people pleasing nature, I guess, is part of it. What were some of the, the most powerful leadership leadership lessons that you've learned? Um, and specifically, as you're pondering that thought, I'm really curious if you ever ran into an issue where you, how do I word this? Like, were you one of the people that thought that leadership was taking all of the arrows and protecting your people, even at the expense of yourself? I mean, you definitely have to protect your people. Of for course. Sure. Um, I don't think there's a, I don't think it's like black and white like that. Honestly, I really don't believe that it's black and white. Um, I kind of forgot your question because there was two. Can you say it again? Sorry. Yeah. Well, so the, the second part of the question was a lot more specific and it stems, basically the question was, uh, you mentioned that you had been soft and overpaid people and like the people pleasing natures and these types of things. And I was curious if you, along your journey, put everyone else at the expense of yourself in your, in the process. Um, because from my experience, in my, my journey, I definitely did that. And I was at my own detriment. And I, I did it in the name of good leadership. Not from a perspective of I don't want to shield my people, but I was like hurting my own well being in that process. And I had to learn the lesson for it. I'm curious what your journey in that process or, or something similar was. Well, the leader is the person that goes first. So if you are going first in not taking care of yourself, busy on meetings, so you miss other important activities, you know, um, you know, like changing times of meetings, et cetera, like whatever, yeah. or delaying making decisions because you want everybody's opinion, then everyone around you is going to start doing those same things. So Ever since the beginning, it was always very important to me that I must be the most decisive, the one that shows up the earliest, the one that leaves the latest, the ones that gives it the most attention to detail, the one that gives the best feedback, because if I am not doing that, then the standard will slip. So as the leader, you are the one that holds the standard. You're the one that sets the bar as to where it needs to be. Okay, so to answer your question, have I sacrifice my own health or whatever in favor of my team or have I sacrificed my personal like being or whatever um I think every leader has to do that but not sense that you should damage your your being well-being your health like I don't mean that what I mean is like as the leader you have to be the one that that holds the space that holds the standard and if you feel like you have you know had to have some like really tough conversations because you need to tell your team the honest truth or if you feel like 
that you have had to spend really long hours working because your team needed something to get done or their work wasn't good enough, then that's your responsibility and your fault, right? Yeah. Because you are the one that didn't fire them if they were doing really bad work, that meant that you had to step in. Or if you had to review their work so much that it literally made you so stressed and they're sending you all these messages on Slack all the time, it's because you didn't set the barrier and the boundary. So as the leader, we have to be the example. And we also have to be the one that sets the parameters and the expectations for the team. Same with our clients, right? Um, I see this all the time. People are promising their client that they're going to have like responses within three hours or less. <laughs> but that's not realistic because you're going to sleep at some point. And so you can't expect that you're going to reply to them in three hours or less while you're sleeping. Yeah. Just as an example. So it's like, how do you set the boundary with the team or the client? Because, um, and maybe I'm just not understanding what you're saying, but like, I think that, yeah, I mean, I'm always gonna, I will always take the bullet for my team if I need to, for sure. Yeah. No, I, I think I love a lot of what you're sharing. Um, and I think you, you towed that line very well. Basically the question was, because I agree, like you, you should, you you should always protect your team in some capacity, and you're leading from the front. You are the example, and I think that the question that I've always been really curious about is to what extent, and ultimately, I guess it stems from the question of why are we building what we're building, right? And making sure that you're staying in alignment with that. So my question really derived from, okay. Uh, we want to take all the arrows, but not at the detriment of everything else, right? So you, you explained it very, very well. Okay, we're going to have to sacrifice as leaders, as business owners, that's just part of it. But we're not going to do it past X, Y, and Z, whatever those may be based on what you're striving for. Um, from a leadership perspective, In this like meteoric growth that you guys have had, what is what is the lesson that you learned that maybe surprised you the most or you didn't expect to learn? Yeah, like how savage people are with suing people. Oh my gosh. I was literally at a mastermind like last week and I was saying how I had this like legal situation and it's making me so stressed and anxious and they were all just like laughing and I was like guys can you not see how stressed I am right now like this is not funny they're like Lauren you know how many times I was sued last year yeah. I was like how many and they're like I don't know like a dozen I'm like what? are you kidding me how are you breathing and this is like the first time it's ever happened to me in my life right as an example and I just couldn't believe it. So that was a recent learning for me, which was honestly quite calming. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, like uh, that was interesting. Um, and uh, <laughs> the other things are that I just believe that running a business is like the per the best personal development that there is in the world. Because every time that something comes up that triggers me, that stresses me out, I just say to myself, how can I use this to develop my patience? And it's just a very simple frame that has helped me a lot because I'm a very impatient person. And if someone starts, for example, like an agency that I work with, right? They just like tagged me in this massive thing on Slack. And they it's just not something that I needed to see. It's something that like my operations manager could have dealt with by herself. But for some reason, they aren't taking her as seriously as they're taking me. And so I just said back, I was like, look, um, thank you so much for tagging me in this. I really appreciate your concern i'm gonna loop in my operations manager because she is more than capable of taking care of this and she's the one that i just sent a screenshot of this too because she's she knows the answer best and so things like that frustrate me because then i think why is this person not seeing that she has more clout than me in this situation like why does it have to come to me and so the framing that i have on that is like people just have an owner boner just let them have it let them like you know want to speak to the owner and it's okay right but like at the end of the day, that's always what we're going to have as a business owner. People are always going to be like, I want to speak to Lauren. Um, 
And so you just have to expect that and, and put parameters around it. And so I even made an article on LinkedIn about the curse of the owner boner. So now if anyone keeps trying to like always say, can I not speak to Lauren? My team just sends that link to them. It's quite funny, but um, that's, a, that's a caveat. And then like a couple of other things is that honestly, I think that it's really easy to overcomplicate stuff. For the longest time, I overcomplicated everything. Even though I had like a simple business model, I made it more complicated than it needed to be. And so I think, operationally it's really hard to be running more than one company at a time you can invest in other companies but you have to decide is this going to be active income like an active business that i'm operationally running or is this going to be an investment that i'm going to have way lower potential profit margins on and i'm going to bring an operator into that to run the thing because i invest in a lot of companies but i am not making the huge profits in those businesses that I make with impact school because impact school is designed to be like a cash flow business mm -hmm. instead of being a potentially exitable business as at least right now you know that will change yeah. for sure like it's changing right now but that's intentional that I'm making those changes lowering the profit bringing other people to the forefront of it etc and bringing in like you know lead channels that don't require me because yeah so that, that I can exit for sure yeah. You've mentioned um you've mentioned the simplicity and the the profit margin a couple times. Uh and before we wrap up here I want to give you a platform to talk about like what do you think uh how do I loop both of these without making this a very drawn out question. It's okay. You can say it. I just I sometimes when I'm hangry I forget stuff, but I'll I'll take a mental note of what you're saying. Yeah, no, but I I don't think it would be a consumable question the way my brain is working right now. So I'm trying to like formulate it a little bit better. I guess I'm curious, um, what allowed you, like what did the simplicity look like and what has led to the most profitability in your business? Because I think uh, I can only speak to my journey, but like when I was trying to fuel hyperbolic growth, profit margins weren't as high as they should have been because I was chasing a different rabbit that ultimately I didn't care about. And I just thought yeah. I always needed to pump money into X, Y, and Z or whatever it yeah. is. And it led me somewhere that I'm grateful for the lessons, but like ended up chasing the wrong rabbit and that's okay at times. I'm curious yeah. for you, what did the simplicity look like? And uh, what do you think has given you the best profitability it led to that? Yeah, I relate to that. So a lot of people think they need a huge stressful sales team and then this massive media buying agency that they work with to run a ton of ads all the time and all this different copy and creative and I've honestly found that having a way smaller sales team and doing things for the most part organically has been what has led to the business that I love running the most so for example instead of having all of these ads that go to this funnel where you get the phone number and then all the setters are calling them all the time and then there's like all these sales going on with barely qualified leads constantly instead of that what we found is better is having just like a couple of appointment setters on the team and then getting everything from social media to go into the dms and then automating that so that people can get the training delivered to them they opt into the training yes it gets their phone number that's really important that does go over to a setter but we give it time so that then they can self-book onto the cal calendar automatically and if they haven't self-booked within like 20 minutes then our setter will phone them up but a lot of times now we've got it to the point where the set is even bypassed. And then we just have a couple of closers on our team who are speaking only to qualified leads because we've pretty much added lead scoring in to the business so that then if somebody doesn't hit the criteria and they're not ranked this much and the calendars are pretty full, then instead of the sales call happening, then instead it just goes either back to the setter or we just send them a free resource. And I know that sounds a little complicated as I say it right now, but it's honestly been, it was for us at least, like I have a great tech team that I hire who have set it up for us, our clients, et cetera. But it's been really life-changing because before I had like 47 people that I was hiring and that yeah. was really Jeez. not fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so instead, what I found is that reducing reducing the amount of things that we sell so we literally sell one thing right now on the front end and it's a high premium price point and then from there ensuring that all the people that come in actually are like really seriously committed to actually making this work 
like not just people that just kind of seen something about it and then maybe interested it's like no they really really want to sell more stuff on social media that's what we do right and then if for example we have a client that we're just not vibing with we just refund them like move on it's not worth our energy yeah. we just don't want to work with those people and the next thing is actually adding automation adding reminders because if a potential client sees some content on social media and they just want to learn more right away a lot of times they'll self-book themselves in without having to have like this crazy appointment setting process in place like this whole like it's it's kind of it's just drawn out and unnecessary and then from there just you know telling them how it is like if you want to join join if not like no stress no big deal um <laughs> we kind of just like took away a lot of the pushing mm -hmm. which we were doing for a long time and instead now we try to attract got it so that solved the simplicity piece and then by le having less people did that also boost profitability because automation was taking on a lot of the the work yeah exactly yeah got it 100 percent. automation and, and also more output on organic got it yeah sweet well, I mean, for what it's worth, I, I see the engagement on your Facebook stuff. It's absolutely mind blowing. I don't see many people with great Facebook engagement. So that's kind of, I mean, it's, yeah, it's weird, right? Idea. Who even uses Facebook? I don't know. I guess some people do. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I don't, but <laughs> people do apparently. Um, yeah, it's, it's random. Every time I go there, it's like nine plus notifications. I know. Oh um before I ask you the last question here, Lauren, I want to give you a platform. Where do you hang out most on social? Where can people follow along? Maybe they're curious about what you do. Uh, plug away. Yeah. So if anyone is wanting to make more sales on social media, the best place to go would be impactschoolmethod.com. There's a free training there that you can get access to. It basically breaks down our entire organic social media sales system. So um, yes, it's pretty good value. And then if well, I guess you like podcasts, right? Because you're listening to this. So uh, we have a show called Impact School. So I think I think there's like two episodes going up a week on that. It's just Impact School on any podcast provider. And then personally, me, I'm just everywhere. So Lauren Tickner, the only one that I honestly really hate is TikTok. So you're probably not going to find anything good there. I think my team posts there, but I personally don't even have the app on my phone. I think it's just like, oh, I don't know. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah lauren tickner on social media and uh the best place to connect yeah like instagram facebook twitter those ones are cool awesome so guys those will be all linked up in the show notes get connected show some love all that fun stuff lauren last question i have for you going all the way back you know starting your fitness journey and then moving into the asset management space because you thought you had to be around the money to make the money realizing that that wasn't it and you know moving into the fitness business and starting to grow and scale and and then eventually getting to the point where you had the transition from this is just my income to this needs to be a business and then mm -hmm. from there continuing to scale putting the right people in place building the automation boosting the profitability all the way to where you're at right now this entire window What's been the biggest lesson that you've learned that has yielded the most results and had the biggest impact on your life and in your business? I think that's had the biggest impact on my life and business has got to be getting really clear on what, what are your values? Because when you know what your values are, you're actually able to create a business and a life that you love rather than chasing the wrong things because it essentially gives you an internal compass to know whether this is something that you should or shouldn't be doing. And then from there, then it, you have so much more clarity on the decisions to make, the best business model for you, the people that you hang around with, the activities that you want to do on a daily basis, and then getting very clear boundaries in place, non-negotiables to ensure that you're actually able to live a life by your values. That's been the biggest thing for me. So good. Lauren, thanks for joining me. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. This is fun. 100%.